In movies like Ace Ventura, The Truman Show, and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Jim Carrey has played parts that people will remember. Many people around the world laugh at his larger-than-life comedic skills, which makes him popular with fans. There is, however, a man behind this lively and apparently happy on-screen persona. This man has been through many storms and tragedies. This is the very personal and sometimes heartbreaking story of Jim Carrey's many problems, heart etches, mental health troubles, and the weird problems that come with being famous. The 17th of January 1962 saw the birth of James Eugene Carey in Newmarket, Canada. Kathleen, his mom, used to be a singer before she became a stay-at-home wife. Percy, his dad, used to be a guitarist in a Toronto big band before he became an accountant to make more money. His mom was from France, Ireland, and Scotland. His dad was French-Canadian, while he was English. The real last name of their family was Carr. As a child, Jim lived in a Catholic home with three older sisters and a brother. He had a hard time as a child because his mom was sick all the time and had to stay in bed, and his dad had a hard time taking care of the family. Scarborough, Ontario, was where the family stayed. Jim went to North York's Blessed Trinity Catholic Elementary School when he was younger. For some reason, he didn't talk much and didn't have many friends. He also had dyslexia, which made school hard for him. Jim had a lot of trouble with depression and took medicine for a long time, on and off. Because he had trouble reading and remembering things, he would spend a lot of time by himself in his room at home. He also practiced making funny faces in the mirror, which helped him get good at meeting new people. Besides that, he used comedy to deal with school. Some teachers didn't like about it, but young Jim learned that making people laugh was a good way to connect with them. As a child, Jim wanted to be a famous comic. It was so important to him that he sent his resume to the people who make the Carol Burnett show when he was only 10 years old. He was very pleased to receive a normal response letter. Jim really liked the 1970s comedy show Monty Python. Ernest Scribbler, played by Michael Palin, who laughed himself to death in a sketch called The Funniest Joke in the World, often gave him ideas. For eight years, Jim's family lived in Burlington, Ontario. He went to Aldershot High School at that time. Later, Jim moved back to Scarborough and went to Agincourt Collegiate Institute for a while. On his 16th birthday, he quit school. His dad lost his job when he was a teenager, and the family lost their house. Their old home in Newmarket had to be moved to an area near Toronto. The elder sister, Pat, had a house where they lived in their VW bus in the driveway. Jim and his brother lived in a tent for months in Lincoln, Ontario's Charles Daly Park, which is right next to Lake Ontario. Jim even made a joke about it later. My dad lost his job and I was homeless for a while. I thought we were just camping because I grew up in Canada. Things got better when his dad got a job at the Titan Wheels tire plant. They were having trouble with money. Jim and his brothers worked at the factory as cleaners and security guards. They even lived close to it. Jim began doing stand-up comedy in 1977 at a club in Toronto when he was a youngster. With his dad's help, he did his first stand-up show at a club in Toronto. His mom chose his clothes and thought a polyester suit would look great on him. Unfortunately, his usual impressions didn't work well in the club's sexy vibe, which made him question his future as an entertainer. After some time, when things got better financially for his family, they moved to a new house. Now that he was financially stable, he faced his fears and went back on stage with a better act in 1979. At the Hayloft Club, he got his first pay. While his performances were making him more well-known in Toronto, Jim also wanted to do sketch comedy. In the early 1980s, he tried out for a part on Saturday Night Live. Gene Domanian, the new director, picked Charles Rocket instead, which was a shame. He did voice work on The All Night Show, a late night show on the CFMT TV channel, when he wasn't chosen for Saturday Night Live. In February 1981, Jim, who was 19 years old at the time, got a job as the opening act for the Rock Band Gatto at the Roxy Theater in Barrie. He was still doing funny accents in Toronto and nearby cities. He was booed off the stage by the rock fans, who didn't like his act. However, two weeks later, the Toronto Star wrote about his act at Yuck Yuck Yucks and called him a rising star. It got him a lot of attention and made people all over Canada want to see his humor. He was on the TV stand-up show An Evening at the Improv in April 1981. In the fall of that year, he played a failing impressionist comedian in the TV movie Introducing Janet. Over a million people in Canada saw the movie, which was Jim's first performing job. By 1982, Jim was said to have put on a comedy show for Jim McCauley and Bud Robinson, two talent scouts from The Tonight Show, to try to get a spot as a stand-up comic on the show. He was already making a living as a comedian at this time. A lot of his jokes were written by him, and he acted in front of famous comedians like Rodney Dangerfield and Buddy Hackett. Jim was known for having a lot of energy on stage and being able to think quickly. He was very good at imitating other people and could play more than 100 different roles from Humphrey Bogart to Kermit the Frog. Jim was told to improve his show more, so he went back to Toronto, 
where he already had a lot of fans. Rodney Dangerfield and Jim got back to Toronto on June 19, 1982. After touring North America with him, he played two sold-out shows at Massey Hall. In early 1983, he made the choice to move to Hollywood and began playing at the Comedy Store. His dream was to be on The Tonight Show, and it looked like he got there in the spring of 1983. Things didn't go as planned because of a bad showing at the Improv. He had a hard time in Los Angeles, but he was still a big hit in Toronto. He played at BB. Kings in late April 1983. There are three nights that Magoon is in Toronto. W5 on CTV did a story on Jim at this time that was shown all over Canada. This is around the time that Jim and Linda Ronstadt began dating. Linda used to be a well-known singer. From 1965 to 1968, she played in the band Stone Ponies. She worked with artists like Paul Simon and Frank Zappa and put out 28 studio records. Linda saw Jim act at the Comedy Store in Los Angeles not long after he moved to Hollywood. That's how they met. He was still living with his parents, which was a surprise. So Linda asked Jim to open for her on tour, but he said no and instead asked her to go on a date. Jim later said nice things about Linda. We were together for about eight months. She was a truly amazing person. He was 15 years younger than Linda at the time. Before the 198586 season, Jim tried out again for Saturday Night Live. He was in movies and had a stand-up act, but Lorne Michaels turned him down without even seeing his work. Even with this delay, Jim's movie Once Bitten did pretty well at the box office when it came out in the middle of November 1985. At least three times, Jim tried to get on Saturday Night Live in the fall of 1986. He got to perform for Lorne Michaels and the other group members, but he was turned down again. Someone else, like Dana Carvey or Phil Hartman, was hired instead. The next year, Jim married Melissa Wimmer, who used to be a pretty good actor. She was in movies like Man on the Moon and Real Stories of the Donut Men. She also went on The Yesterday Show with John Kerwan. They met when Jim was having trouble as a comic, and she worked as a waitress at the comedy club where he did shows. Soon, they had a daughter named Jane Aaron Jim. Jim thought he needed to get better at what he did because he didn't want to be stuck doing copies for a living. Jim chose to start a new comedy act. He stopped doing versions of famous people and started adding observational and character-based humor to his shows, even though this meant letting down club owners and improvising in front of unhappy crowds. Even though Jim was working on his comedy, he was still trying to become an actor. From 1990 to 1994, he was on the TV show In Living Color. This helped his success and got him his first big movie part. In February 1994, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective came out and made $72 million in the U.S. and Canada. Jim played the lead role in the movie. Great deals were made on sequels and other movies for him. When it came out in July 1994, The Mask made $351 million around the world. Also Dumb and Dumber, which came out in December 1994 and made over $270 million around the world, was a big hit. Jim was up for a Golden Globe for The Mask, and he was also ranked second on the list of the 10 biggest earners in Hollywood. As Jim became famous in Hollywood, he had to deal with a lot of sadness in his own life. His mother died in 1991 and his father died in 1994, not long after each other. Jim told a sweet story about his dad. He said that his dad could have been a great comedian but chose to be an accountant because he didn't think comics were in his genes. Jim stressed how important it is to take risks when doing what you love because he learned from his dad's mistake. Jim said that the failure of his father was what made him want to be a comedian. Jim was strong even after the death of both of his parents and kept putting all of his efforts into his work. His role as the Riddler in Batman Forever in 1995 was very good. His role as Ace Ventura came back in the same year with Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. A lot of money was made from the movies, but Jim also had to deal with another tragedy he and Melissa were going to get a divorce in the same year. They had been married since 1987, but things got harder for them as Jim got more famous. Reports said that Jim had a complicated personality and would act both concerned and distantly. When Jim started dating actress Lauren Holly, they broke up because she was dating someone else. They met on the set of Dumb and Dumber. After a long court fight, they agreed to pay $25,000 a month in child support as part of their divorce. And Melissa gets $3 million. Jim got married to Lauren Holly a year after getting separated from his first wife. On September 23, 1996, they got married on top of a mountain. When they were together, Lauren said she didn't break up Jim's family, even though it was clear they fell in love on the set of the movie and Jim cheated on his wife. But they were only married for nine months, and Lauren's work didn't improve while she was with the famous actor. She was entitled to half of Jim's earnings while they were married. This included the $20 million he made from playing a different type of character in the movie Liar and the Cable Guy, which didn't get great reviews. But he was great in the comedy Liar, for which he was nominated for another Golden Globe Award for Best Actor. 
Jim agreed to work for less money on The Truman Show in 1998. It was a Golden Globe for him. The movie got good reviews from critics who said it gave Jim a new way to show off his playing skills. Later that same year, he was a guest on The Larry Sanders Show and made fun of Gary Shandling's character. In 1999, he won another Golden Globe for his role as comic Andy Kaufman in the movie Man on the Moon. In 2000, Jim worked with the Farrelly brothers again on the movie Me, Myself and Irene, in which he played a state cop with many personalities. The movie did well at the theaters. He was also nominated for a Golden Globe for his role as the Grinch in How the Grinch Stole Christmas the same year. It was said that Jim was seeing another actress, January Jones, after his second split. She was new to Hollywood at the time and had small parts in movies like Bandits, Taboo, and Full Frontal. Being with Jim helped her job because he was now a pretty well-known actor. Jim was in the movie Bruce Almighty with Jennifer Aniston and Morgan Freeman a year after they started dating. The movie did very well all over the world. It wasn't a surprise that Jones went on to play more important parts in movies like Anger Management and finally Mad Men in 2007. Even though her work took a big step forward, her relationship with Jim ended quickly. Renee Zellweger and Jim started dating seriously while they were both in the movie with me, Irene, and myself. They went on dates and were even engaged for a short time. Their union did not last long, though minus 18 months. The National Enquirer says they got engaged because Renee told him she wouldn't stay out with him unless he proposed within a year. According to a source, Jim's mood swings made Renee feel bad. Renee was also said to have a short fuse. Jim didn't want any more kids because he already had a teenage daughter. Renee did, though. Because of all of these problems, they broke up quickly. Jim kept his attention on his job even after another bad relationship. In 2004, he got citizenship in both the United States and Canada. In the same year, Jim was in the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. A lot of people liked the show. Some reviewers said Jim's show was the best he's ever done. He was nominated for a Golden Globe and his first BAFTA award. After that, he was in a series of unfortunate events by Lemony Snicket. He was added to the Canadian Walk of Fame that same year. When Jim's next famous girlfriend came along, she was Jenny McCarthy in 2005. She was well known at that time for her parts in Scary Movie 3, What I Like About You, and The Bad Girl's Guide. A lot of people in Hollywood loved them as a couple for five years. Until they broke up all of a sudden in 2010, which shocked everyone. Jenny publicly attacked Jim on Howard Stern's radio show in 2012 for not seeing her autistic son since they broke up. She said he had abandoned the boy after being a big part of his life before. But in 2014, when Shia LaBeouf said bad things about Jim's parenting, she stood up for him. It was clear that her relationship with Jim had gotten better. Jim still didn't give up, and he's doing very well in the movie business. He has been in movies like I Love You, Philip Morris, A Christmas Carol, and Mr. Popper's Penguins in 2014. He even did a follow-up to Dumb and Dumber. Jim broke up with Kathriona White after that. She was from Ireland and did makeup and styled famous people like David Hasselhoff and Lindy Greenwood. In 2012, Jim and Kathriona began going out together. They broke up in 2013 and got back together in May 2015. She had sadness and had said she wanted to hurt herself in the past. She tragically killed herself in 2015, just a few days after they broke up. She had told her friends before that she loved Jim a lot and that their relationship was very exciting. She thought he was leaving her because she felt like she relied on him a lot. She wasn't dating Jim at the time of her death, but he helped take her body to the grave in Ireland. Bridget Sweetman, Kathriona's mother, and Mark Burton, her ex-husband, tried to sue him for her death, so he almost had to go to court. Her mother said her daughter killed herself because Jim broke up with her. Jim had to show that her death wasn't his fault. His lawyers found out that a paper from 2011 that said she was healthy before meeting him was not real. This cleared Jim's name for good. In spite of this, some news sites said Jim abused his ex-girlfriend and used her and encouraged her to use drugs. In 2016, Jim was seen with another woman, and the paparazzi even took pictures of the two of them leaving a restaurant in California. Then, Jim kind of dropped out of the public eye and didn't get many movie parts after that, just a couple that same year. The last thing people saw him in was the TV show Kidding, where he played Jeff. Hi, Mr. Pickles. It seems like his last relationship had a big effect on him, and people say he's been different ever since. Memoirs and Misinformation is the name of the book he wrote in 2020. After that, he went on Saturday Night Live and tried to act like Joe Biden. But many people didn't think his funny style fit with Biden's quiet personality. Jim has chosen that he will no longer play Biden on the show after December 2020. In the 2020 Sonic movie, he played the bad guy. 
Some said it was one of his best shows in a long time because it was so good. They brought him back for Sonic the Hedgehog 2 in 2022 because he did such a great job the first time. When it first came out in the US, the movie did very well and gave Jim his best start ever. In 2022, he was also the voice of The Weeknd's record Dawn FM. Jim said that he might not be in any more movies after April 2022 because he felt like he had done enough. He said that he might come back if there is a certain story that he thinks people should see. I might keep going if the angels bring me some kind of gold written script that says it's going to be very important for people to see, but for now I'm taking a break. His friends have been worried about him though since he quit Hollywood in 2022 to focus on art. They said he hasn't been as active as he used to be and has decided to be by himself. On his 62nd birthday, friends thought he looked a little different and a lot of them think Jim's body and mind looked like they had been through a lot. Some news sources say that Jim got a great story for a movie in February 2024 and he was going to play Dr. Robotnik again in the third Sonic movie. Jim has gone from having a hard youth to becoming very famous, which is truly inspiring. A kid holds on to a dream, but not for himself or for selfish reasons. Instead, he works hard to become successful in comedy for his father, who had to give up his own hopes and dreams to take care of his family. Jim's life shows how to keep going even when things get hard. Even with all the problems he's had, Jim has had a huge effect on the showbiz world. We can only look forward to the next part of Jim's amazing story now that he is back in the public eye.